Um, all right. So now uh, we move to uh, Vivian's paper. Uh, and uh, when uh, I must say that uh, when uh, Denise volunteered to discuss Kristen's paper, I was absolutely delighted because I wanted to start our workshop off on the right foot. And I knew uh, Denise would do that. But in so doing, I didn't realize that I was actually setting up uh, Kamal and myself because Denise is a tough act to follow. Um, so, uh, so we'll do our best here. Um, and so I want to just begin. Uh, I'll start with some comments, and then Kamal will add his. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to begin here uh, by saying, uh, uh, Vivian, that I've actually been interested in your work on discursive institutionalism for some time. Uh, and I, I think it has a very important contribution to our political analysis. Um, some of my comments are going to be um, critical, uh, very critical of, 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 um, of the idea of discursive institutionalism and the limits um, that I think you wrongly impose on it. Um, uh, but I want to underscore the only reason I am critical in such a way is because I think the, the work that you do has such great promise, right? So uh, let me um, uh, then just briefly uh, summarize uh, the, um, uh, the essay. Um, it's really divided into three parts. The first part situates the Rudolph's uh, approach uh, in the epistemological debates of the 1950s and 1970s. The second part explores the debates in the philosophies of science and social science that had a major influence on uh, political sciences at the time uh, in the process of locating the Rudolph scholarly affinities. Um, and then the third part uh, discusses discursive institutionalism as a successor to interpretivism as it was developed in response to the neo-institutional turn in comparative politics and in political science in general. Right? Um, so I want to just briefly uh, talk about um, each of these different um, uh, sections. Um, uh, and let me say, I thought that the first section really makes a valuable contribution. Um, I think it's very helpful for this volume to situate the Rudolph's work uh, in the ongoing debates of their time, uh, showing how they reacted to the work. I think it really helps to explain uh, their perspective, and I found that uh, very useful. Um, I actually uh, have a little bit more sort of detailed um, uh, sort of summary of your work in, in each of these sections, uh, but I'm, I'm going to uh, skip over that um, to let me say this, that uh, the um, section uh, where um, you, after the, the discussion of the epistemological debates, you go on to uh, the second section where you discuss part the philosophies of science and part the philosophies of social science, um, uh, breaking them down. I think that because your paper is a little bit long, I think that those, those, the first section and the second section can be combined together. Um, and in your discussion of the philosophies of science first and then of the philosophies of social science, um, I found the Rudolphs in a way to disappear. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion about sort of different thinkers, etc. But there's much less contextualization of the Rudolphs. And I found them to be much better contextualized in the first section. But I think they need to be contextualized in all the sections. And so if, if um, you know, we were trying to cut the paper down from over 13,000 uh, words to 10,000 words, that's the area where I think I would sort of try to condense uh, and better con contextualize the Rudolphs. All right? So, um, so on those sections, I want to just talk a little bit then about your discussion of uh, discursive institutionalism, um, which I think um, uh, you actually, in your discussion, update uh, in useful ways. So I really liked how you are thinking about power in ideas, et cetera. Um, a lot of the work on discourse, I think, doesn't adequately conceptualize power. So I think you're making a very valuable contribution. Um, one criticism I want to make is, I think that social science, or that political science in particular, has gone far beyond the focus on institutionalism that was so important in the 1990s. Um, and so this is a, and I think 
in some way, and I, I know in some ways your work focusing on discourse has relevance for issues far beyond institutionalism. And so I worry in a sense that by tying your framework to sort of the, as you call it, the neo-institutionalist turn, which really sort of tur turned in the 1980s and 1990s, that you're looking backward too much um, to sort of the literature, and particularly the, the Peter Hall sort of article came out in 1996, and not looking forward enough to sort of current focus in, in, in political science, which I think goes beyond um, uh, sort of this focus on institutionalism. Um, so that's, that's uh, one point um, I wanted to make. Um, uh, the other point uh, I wanted to make about this um, was a point that you alluded to. Um, that is that your work on discursive institutionalism is really about, it sort of all reminds me of Habermas, it's really about sort of rational discourse. Um, and one of the most valuable contributions I think you make is how this rational discourse contributes to political agency. That is, that through this discourse, people are able to gain sort of a critical detachment, um, uh, and therefore, um, through that critical detachment, develop perspectives that underpin their ability to act to bring about change. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, but I also think that if we look at discourse today, and maybe I'm just influenced by American politics and sort of the Trump sort of phenomenon, um, I think that there's so much more to discourse, and I think of Kristen's sort of highlighting of the importance of emotion in discourse. Uh, and that just seems to be a realm of the types of political exchanges that go on um, that I think could in some ways be incorporated into what you're doing, um, uh, but, uh, but at this point it's not, so you, you sort of limit your analysis. So maybe, I just think either you need to sort of be conscious of those limits and to sort of justify your focus, which might be the prudent way uh, of dealing with this issue, or sort of somehow acknowledge and think a little bit, maybe one of the the benefits of this workshop is being exposed to this other work and, and sort of being confronted with its potential relevance. Um, okay, um, finally, uh, let me say, in your conclusion, um, I think I really, uh, this is a, a, almost an editorial comment more than a substantial comment, I would really be interested in your conclusion doing two things. Um, one is to clearly state what your perspective adds to sort of the Rudolph's interpretivism, or you know, as you say, sort of more conventional interpretism, because you are making an argument that you are adding things, and I think you are adding things. Um, and then, in your conclusion, I would once again really like you to think about and to concisely say what you think discursive intercourse, or whatever we want to call it, um, sort of what it adds more broadly to, to sort of how we think in comparative politics today. I mean, I think it does add a lot, but I think it needs to be clearly stated. Okay, I'll turn the floor over to Uh Vivian, uh, thank you for a wonderful paper, and... Just yeah. just one second. Oh, no, now it's, it was, everything was frozen before, and now I've just, it works, so please go on. How long have you been frozen for? Uh, while you were talking, the last five minutes. But that's okay, because I just didn't see you talking. But now I can see she everyone. Can hear you. Oh, okay. You speak. Okay. All right. <laughs> that's what okay. That's good. All right. Uh, I actually uh, I learned a lot, and I and and it's, and it's uh, it'll be very uh, useful for my own work. But I also looked at some of your other pieces, uh, the four other pieces that. Uh, uh, Three of them you had sent, and uh, then uh, a fourth piece that I discovered. Um, and so my comments come from not just this work, but also the other pieces. And I'm uh, directing it at, um, I'm wondering whether the Rudolph situated knowledge and your discursive institutionalism might differ in one aspect. And that is, situated knowledge meant engaging with a specific orientation and sort of methodological disposition. What is, and what is gained by opening up um, uh, situated knowledge to us? 
but I find that as I'm reading it, uh, discursive uh, institutionalism becomes an umbrella concept, which situated knowledge is not. So what is gained by opening up discursive knowledge, uh, institutionalism as an umbrella co concept, and what is theoretically lost, uh, you know, uh, is something that, that came to me. And, I, I, and this ties to what Leela actually brought up, that mixed methods are not really mixed method because the, 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 they're using quantitative analysis, but almost like salad dressing on the top. And, and I'm wondering uh, whether discursive institutionalism is being overly ambitious then. In, in a way in which situated knowledge is not. And uh, so that's one. The other is, um, and so what is getting lost in sense, or diluted? My second com uh, comment is about the emphasis on interaction in institutional change. Uh, and, and so I started focusing on recognition. Does recognition of others' ideas and actors, and so I'm emphasizing recognition of others' ideas and actors plays a role. Uh, interaction cannot occur in isolation. It must recognize others' ideas, so the policies, programs, philosophies, or actors, elites, institutions, or a civil society that are located within the same discursive field that you're talking about. So actors who wield power through and in ideas must either de facto or de jure recognize and acknowledge who the other uh, ideas are, what those other ideas are. So the role of recognition and acknowledgement of the other, which overlaps with the Rudolphs actually, uh, within the same discursive field, is vital to determining the type of interaction that occurs and which type of that interaction then leads to the institutional change that you're explaining. Now it's clear that you're already doing this, and I'm inserting recognition into it. So I, I sort of submit this for your consideration. Um, so in a sense, what I'm saying is that interactions that are produced might be disaggregated and recognized subcategory-wise, in a sense. Uh, and so what I'm saying is we might have to situate further uh, the ideas by disaggregating them, which of, them's get, uh, which of them get dis uh, recognition in institutional change and the interaction that leads to institutional change. Yeah. OK. Do you want to uh, comment, or should we go on to other, other, uh, other discussions, other comments from the group? I'd actually like to respond to okay. comments. Uh, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful. Uh, set of thoughts and, and, and comments. Um, so on discursive, because there's sort of one big question is why am I doing discursive institutionalism? Well, in a way, I sort of explained in the beginning of the paper, I have a meta-theoretical object here. <laughs> what I'm doing is sort of situated knowledge because the Rudolph situated in their own time period were responding to those people at the time, they develop interpretivism as a general umbrella concept of how one goes about looking at things, then situated knowledge becomes their way, their particular methodological approach. So similarly for me, discursive institutionalism, I mean, among <laughs> other things, remember that I'm trying to, it starts in the 1990s, so there's a reason why I end up with this term, discursive institutionalism, um, and maybe I'm stuck with it, um, but I develop it because in the methodological wars in the 1990s, not only could you not be pluralist, but you could not do interpretive work. You could either do rational choice institutionalism, historical institutionalism, or sociological institutionalism. So I kind of invent discursive institutionalism as a way of legitimating what I wanted to do. And in doing so, I discover this wide, vast range of scholarship that's fascinating, that is interpretive in so many different ways. Um, 
uh, that goes all the way from the substantive content of ideas and the focus on that, especially in the ideational turn in comparative politics, all the way through to more discursive interactions, whether the policy people who focus on what I call the coordinative discourse amongst policy actors or media types who look at communication, etc. So what I, I essentially, so I create this concept, this umbrella concept of discursive institutionalism, at the same time that I say, and, and I do the epistemology as well, and say, look, there's this wide range of people who go from a kind of rationalist, constructivist approach to a highly um, relativist uh, or structuralist, if we look at post-structuralist, post-modernists. And although I don't usually go as far as postmodernists and post-structuralists, slowly but surely I began saying, wait, they can be part of this happy family as well. We can certainly, even if you don't buy the epistemology or ontology, you can certainly see that the methods, the way they try to situate knowledge is very useful and interesting. So I do that, and I say, however, I don't, you know, I have my own specific views of how to deal with this, and the Wittgenstein um, is very helpful to me, and it's something I discovered when I was doing the philosophy of science. Um, but in order to be able to say that you don't end up ha having to end up in radical relativism, uh, and it's very, you know, it's very close to the Rudolph's way of thinking about situated knowledge, reflection, etc. Um, so that's one one piece of this, and 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 John, you probably are right that there's a danger in having this label now, because I too am moving on, um, and in recent work I may mention this is just you know to make it clear. Remember, people, I do discursive institutionalism, but when I talk about power and ideas, you know, you don't need the discursive institutionalism to understand why it is I'm talking about different ways of thinking about power. So on the theory side, I'm going beyond that. And I'm very careful, especially in the 2008 article, to say that, yes, I use Habermas, but he's just one of many. Uh, on the discursive interaction side and on the ideational side, the you know it's Searle, but you could also use Bourdieu. And it's a way of trying to open this up and saying there's a wide, you know, large number of people. Um, but maybe, and I think there's right, uh, we're not going farther, far enough. Um, and I should say, I've done a recent piece on um, uh, Brexit and Trump, where I talk about, actually, the, all the things that one would need to do in order to do, and this is just mainly about the campaigns, how one goes about uh, understanding this phenomenon. Uh, so I tried to do a little I told you so. You can't explain all of this unless you use ideas and discursive interactions. You know, if you're only talking about the economics or the socio, or the identity politics or, um, uh, or the politics, people feeling that they've lost control, none of that will explain why this happened now in this way. And that is, and Kristen, you're right, it's about charismatic leadership. You know, but Trump found the words, or the Brexit people found the words to translate people's emotions um, and their ideas. So this is, you know, we're going beyond the rational now, but it's still about ideas and interaction. Um, so, I, you know, you're right to push me, uh, but I mean, there's a lot that I didn't end up putting in here. Um, and my view is that only with an interpretive approach. Um, or ideas discourse approach, can you actually bridge to questions of morality, questions of legitimacy, you know, to the political philosophy issues? That's the only way. So, uh, Kristen, it makes perfect sense to me that you start out doing rational choice, you have a set of questions that rational choice can't explain because they're so rationalist. And it is about emotion, but it's also about morality. These are different ways. And so I've just been doing uh, this book that I that's not finished. Well, I have a discursive institutionalism book that's not finished, and right now I'm trying to uh, finish a book on the Eurozone crisis as the EU's crisis of legitimacy. Um, 
And there I'm essentially trying to talk about different ways in which um, one can think about legitimacy, and it's not just uh, about what's often termed in the EU studies literature. Again, we're stuck with antiquated terms. They're using Easton input and output legitimacy. Um, and so I invent throughput legitimacy um, as a way to say it's not just about uh, political participation, it's not just about um, uh, policy performance, it's also about procedural. And once you get to the procedural, again, it's all about the kinds of interactions that people have uh, in a policy field. Okay. Um, uh, other uh, comments? Asima. Um, so I have one comment, um, especially uh, related to where you discuss power and power of ideas of different kinds of disaggregating the power of ideas. Um, this one theoretical approach, which is you know the Stephen Luke's discussion on power, he kind of came up in 1970s, the three dimensions of power, which might be useful because what he does is the first dimension of power is decision making power, the second dimension is non decision making power, where actually ideas will come up because it's really about how. Mo bias is mobilized or how certain uh, policy ideas are removed from the policy discussion. And third is uh, really shaping the wants and desires of people. So in fact through, uh, and there I think your discursive institutionalism will, you know, will, will be useful. But I think those, the three phases of power discussion by Stephen Hughes might be a useful theoretical uh, addition to your discussion on power. Uh, can I just respond to that? Uh, yeah. Fact, what, actually, let's, fact, let's 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 because we're we're really tight on time. Let's uh, we'll group the questions and then let you respond. Okay, go ahead, Kristen. Okay, uh, I thought it was a terrific paper, and I want to disagree with ninety percent of what John said. Okay. Um, I think I would give a retitle to this. I think I would call it something like uh, situating the Rudolph's work in the political science debates of the what a twentieth century, and then have a colon with discursive institutionalism is a new fourth institutionalism. And I think that I would make it the first chapter in the book. Yeah. I would keep everything uh, from page 7 to 16, which is, I think, what you were saying you thought you needed to be more about the Rudolphs. Right. I don't think yeah. I would do that. I think I would keep it pretty much the way it is and change the conclusion a little bit along the lines that um, Kamal suggested. Um, and not what you said, you wanted it to add what, say what you added to the Rudolph's work. I would turn it around and say, uh, emphasize a little bit more how the Rudolph's inspired you in your work, because I think looking forward is what we want to do. I think you want to avoid making this the typical Feshrif kind of thing and make it more, uh, which I think pu publishers will go for more. This is what the Rudolph's did, and look at all that came out of it just in this one in, in, in um, Vivian's work, um, and then I think how the situated knowledge differs from um, discursive institutionalism would be useful. But I think this is, I think the whole section that she has on this, you know, debates in the philosophy of science, maybe 6 to 16, I think that really sets up the whole context for the rest of the volume. No, I agree so with you, I like that. and I agree with your point that yeah. it should be the first chapter. Yeah. I, and yeah. Because it does yeah. that, but I think that rather than have a discussion of these different, uh, I guess my point is rather than have a discussion of these different uh, sort of analytical frameworks in and of themselves, right, I think um, the, the point of the discussion should be how does this help us to sort of situate what the Rudolphs have to say. Well, maybe put that section first then. Start with, you know, have yeah. an introduction, and then have page six come in with the philosophy of science things, and then have the section on how the Rudolphs dealt with all of this. Yeah. And then how that influenced you. Right, but I, sense, I, don't think it's, I don't think you need to set, my point is, the yeah. discussion is good and valuable, and that's why I think okay. it should be the first chapter. Yeah. But I don't think you need to separate the discussion from a sort of then the Rudolphs as sort of you know saying okay so these people raise the, these issues in yeah. sort of integrate sort of okay so the Rudolphs response all I'm really saying is that I think you can do a better job of of you know we're talking about situated knowledge yeah. of situating the Rudolphs in this sort of broader set of discourses 
right? Um, uh, so integrating them more as opposed to, um, you, you do sort of talk about them in the first section. I really like the first section as a model for the following section, and I just think it could be sort of condensed and the Rudas could be better integrated. And you might want to do a little bit with perestroika, just mention it. In. Yeah, yeah. Okay, other... Uh, Great chapter, though. Other, other questions, comments, reactions? I do have a question, comment, reaction. Good. Uh, <clears throat> um, this is a more general question for all of us. I think that, that uh, in thinking about sort of situated knowledge, I'm always curious what are the methodological implications of situated knowledge. And to give one example, uh, Bharat Ramaswamy is doing some wonderful work now comparing what the vernacular press says about rural items and things going on in agriculture and what the English language press. And they're like, they're like, 180 degrees different. So, who, where is the interpreting frame? Who's the interpreter? And um, how? What is there a methodology for figuring out how you situate? No, I mean, you have to know a whole lot about a frame that I think is often inaccessible to most scholars. And not only that, is so incredibly variable over both time and space when you're dealing with something like India, right? So, I, I just worry about that methodological implication. Where do we go with? It's nice to say that. You know, emotions are important, narratives are important, stories are important. Everybody believes that. But how do you know what the effect is, what the methodological take on But also in situated knowledge, I think the Rudolphs were social scientists. And I think social scientists try to figure out what behavior occurs so regularly across time and space and culture that we can call it a science. And I think they were there. I thought they had their feet in both camps of that. They understood the the in, you know interpretive and the situational aspect of it, but I think they also believed, and maybe Frank knows more about this, that they were serious social scientists. Yeah, no, I I agree yeah. with that, and so they're not that differentiates them from one school of interpretivism. Right. I mean, right. in your paper, you talk, they they're not relativists either. No, um, and, uh, and, gets into and they do have a faith in being able to make more general, albeit highly qualified, yeah. you know, to context but more general theoretical observations. Right. I mean, think of in pursuit of Lakshmi. I mean, right. you know, they're, they are sort of trying to right. sort of draw theoretical observations. And I think Vivian's paper, the chapter, is the right one to raise some of these issues. Yeah, yeah. But I want to, I mean, just, uh, I mean, Ron is raising, I think, sort of a really important, more general questions about methodology, sort of the methodology of, of you know, sort of situated knowledge, et cetera. Um, and I just wonder if we could take maybe five minutes just to discuss that, because I think it's, it's helpful to a lot of the book. Um, so, I mean, one clear thing is, it seems to me that we're saying that somehow narrative sort of as a method um, is important. It seems another thing we're saying is um, interviews somehow as a method, and particular types of interviews seem to be important. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure there are other, and I want to open to other people to suggest sort of other sort of implications they see. But to me, what's, I think some of the, much of that is there, but what I think I'd like to see develop more is what, in fact, um, uh, are other, let's call them more conventional social science approaches missing by sort of marginalizing those types of narratives. And I just, I think, you know, that's really important for the book to make a broader contribution, that we try to clarify exactly that. And that's where uh, Parish Twike comes in. Mm -hmm. I think... Stephen, well, Stephen. So, I mean, just one thing that the interviews give is, is a sense of purpose and intentionality in actions, rather than just inferring what's going on from, from what we see. So in the, in the um, interviews with... Um, Nehru, as well as uh, Chavan and, and state-level leaders in the early 1960s, um, there's, there's clear evidence that certain things were being done specifically to try and deal with, um, with civil-military relations and try and solve that as a problem, right? And, and so otherwise you would have just said this is a political act done for some other reason but it, or organizational reason, but it's clear because we have a smoking gun statement uh, yeah. Not just from him, but from other people, why why that was done, and that's very important, and that's being missed in a different kind of social science. So, can I ask you something? Because um, one type of social science, and actually Suzanne refers to this in her Perestroika, you know, sort of emphasizes uh, causality and causation, 
really, and says that purpose and intention really isn't that important it's, you know, to their analysis. It's really about causation, and that causation sort of can be um, uh, inferred um, uh, without sort of going to purpose and intentionality, right? So I guess I'm sort of, in light of that context, I'm sort of asking you sort of, uh, um, so what what can we say that sort of a focus on intentionality and purpose uh, and sort of meaning um, sort of adds to that broader sort of other type of... Well, one, one quick response is that there, there are almost always multiple possible interpretations that you can give for any particular uh, institutional or political act. Yep. And how are you ever going to sort that out unless you have some statements uh, you know, of course, maybe you should triangulate them, figure out what people are saying, private correspondence, uh, unguarded moment, there are a variety of ways you right. can do that. But otherwise, um, I don't see how you can ever get to determinative answers. Mm -hmm. yeah, because, yeah, because I think uh, social collectivities or, or structural <coughs> factors might give rise to a number of possible uh, actions. So I think uh, interviews or, or a more focused analysis of the intentions will tell you how uh, you know, the sociality translates into the actual action. So that kind of a mode of translation. Although I must say that, you know, we must not fall into the other trap that, into because it, sometimes interviews, people people mislead in your interviews. They are going to take credit for whatever has happened. Right. And so you have right. to figure out, first you have to do many interviews to figure out are there other social or political dynamics that cause them to do it. Because, you know, that's why I think the number of interviews makes a difference, but also you have to, you know, um, C. Wright Mill said, sociological imagination is the interplay of biography and history. And I think if we have to bring in a political imagination kind of analysis, then we have to think of, again, the interplay of biography and the larger uh, dynamics. So interviews can be... Or context. Or context. Yes. Context. Right. right. So, so I'm hearing that um, not only is intention important because that's how you know why they made a decision, yes. right. one decision and not another decision. But I'm also hearing at a theoretical level, it's important because it helps you maybe to discern from alternative theories that might explain a similar outcome, which of those theories is likely yeah. to be more balanced. Yeah. So one, one, one instance is they did this interview with General Chowdhury, um, the chief of the army. And, and he said, um, when talking about Pakistan, that um, what must have happened was that his old military colleague Ayub Khan, seeing that politicians were making a mess of things, had stepped in to put things right. Right. So one of the main theories as to why India is different than Pakistan is that essentially they just have different political traditions and the military had essentially been trained and professionalized in a different way. And a statement like that makes it obvious that there was an alternative path that could have happened had there been other kinds of things. So it's not a clear intention of an act that happened. It's it's sort of evidence of another potential right. pathway, which I think relates to the, the paper. You have a you have a sentence in the in the in the paper along those lines of alternative pathways that could have been taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah well, uh, I want to emphasize what Asima said that smoking gun is a great metaphor, uh, Steve. We still don't know why we went to war in Iraq, right? In the, in the crazy Bush war. It's just not known. And people, it's like retroflexy voting. People mm -hmm. always claim in retrospect that what they did was consistent with a set of values. So, so this is not an easy sort. It's not as though a narrative is just kind of written on stone tablets. The, the, the interpretive nature of this is extraordinarily complex. I was thinking about one of my PhD students was working on the effects of um, uh, affirmative action on Panchayati Raj institutions, and it turns out that that you know you talk to women who are Panchayat Pradhans, and they say, oh, I don't know anything. My husband does everything. You have to talk to my husband, even though they are the Panchayat. And then you find out later on that's not quite true. That's just the story you give in the official. So you know, where do you go to get this kind of, of narrative truth? And I, I honestly don't know. I mean, you can go through a thousand interviews in Rajasthan, and figure out some things. But it's not always clear that you can generalize anything about that sort of narrative truth. That's what I'm curious about. Yeah, I think uh, <coughs> something that I uh, I have in our paper as well. The I, I I've discovered that especially for issues where uh, populations that are running away from the state or are critical of the state, illegal flows, uh, oppositional, uh, iterative interviews. Mm -hmm. right. So so the if you look at the first few interviews. 
they, they view anyone who's trying to conduct an interview with a mic as state agents. And I found this in Indonesia as well as in Indian, India. And so the urban poor are saying they must be census takers, even though they know that we are civilians from another country, they're still thinking this is how state actors act. And so you get interviews, extensive, they'll open up to interviews, but then they'll say exactly what is expected of them in such surveys, because they view you as state agents. And so then that interview is actually an act of building trust. And so then you down the line, truth comes out in patches, right. which means yeah, then you are asking yourself, how many our iterative conversations or interviews will it take right. before I get the truth? It turns out that, for example, the Indonesian uh, agencies and NGOs conduct interviews on behalf of the World Bank. These interviews give ready-made answers for what is expected of them without covering issues that may be controversial. So even though they are voluntary interviews, Populations are giving answers that are expected of them. So then you're, if you're looking for truth on the ground, situated knowledge, then it's a longer process. How many, but how many interviews can a graduate student yeah, conduct absolutely. in a four-month fieldwork or six-month fieldwork? And so then what kind of truth, where, where is truth? In the second, third interview or in the sixth interview? And are you allowed to spend so much time getting to know your respondent and and acquire trust. So this is a, and this doesn't just go to interviews, but it goes to surveys, it goes to opinion polls, it goes to, all those are interviews in some. But just, just, a, just a, um, before I turn the floor over to Leela and then to Ron, I, you know, our, the issue now with a lot of our graduate students is getting them to do field work at all, you know, as opposed to, right. you know, doing this econometric stuff. Anyway, Leela. So, Kind of building on a couple of things. So in, I I tend not. So we're assuming interviews are kind of like a de facto method, right? So you can approach qualitative fieldwork in many different kinds of ways. So interviews, if you're doing, um, if you think of interviews in conjunction with observation, you're not necessarily taking what someone says as a reflection of the truth. And I oh, I think I tend to think of the Rudolph's approach of situated knowledge as really the kind of deep immersion which our students are not willing to do anymore. So in some ways, we're losing what they embody in terms of how the current knowledge in the marketplace is working. Um, so you may have a set of interviews, but you're kind of, you're interviewing, you're observing the dynamics, with different, and you're, you're cross-checking what different people are saying. And then the second thing I was saying, I was thinking, which goes directly to what you were, you were talking about, Ron, which is that you don't necessarily have to take the interview as a reflection of truth but the interview can tell you about the social and power dynamics. So if you have a series of women who are in leadership positions saying, this is about my husband, you don't have to take that as truth, but what it tells you is that the kind of like official patriarchal structure means that they have to have that script. So it's an official transcript. Which, and so that's not then taking it as truth, but that's telling you how power works. At the, at the, at the, at the reality is, of course, there's variance across yes, individuals, exactly. and it's hard but it to tells know you, But it gives are. you a sense of the power structures yeah. Yeah, that sure. the women are navigating because they have to tell yeah. that story. Or the, the unofficial, I'm thinking of Scott's or uh, yes. you know, hidden transcripts. The hidden yeah. transcripts right. are supposed to be official ones. Yeah. In, yeah. in fact, there's a, uh, like Sarita Brar, this is Pradika Pichai Panchayat, sort of the, the behind the scene, behind the curtain Panchayat that really runs everything. But you don't get to that until you have this enormously deep immersion. You may never figure it out. But I want to make a more general point about the perestroika business, which is that I mean, data are social products. And the conditions of their production affect their relationship to any kind of reality. Mm -hmm. And so that being the case, we have to ask under what conditions will these things produce. The reason I raised the thing about the Chadi Raj Institution, there's a lot of debate about is affirmative action having any real effect? Or is it, in fact, just putting up women as puppets um, <coughs> that are run by their uncles or husbands or whatever? And I mean, it's a serious debate, because there's literature on both sides of that, um, on the, both sides of that divide, whether it makes any difference, whether it's doing a good thing or not doing a good thing, or whether it's increasing certain kinds of village tensions that you don't want to increase. So it's a serious question. It's a political science -y type question. And I don't think we have a convincing answer that covers all of the parameters. Mm -hmm. I just want to highlight, I think that the observation that data are um, social products and the conditions of production are important is 
I mean, that I think really gets at part of what we do when we situate knowledge. That is, we're situating, you know, how that data is generated. And I think that's really important. And so, in that sense, turning to Vivian in just one second, in that sense, interviewing, it seems to me, is your, it was, we were saying, sort of helps to understand those conditions of production and therefore helps us to better contextualize that data and better understand it. Vivian. Yeah, no, just listening to this, it seems to me it's quite clear we need some place where we talk about interviews. Uh, and also related to the DATR that Kristen has a large footnote on, but I think that should come up, you know, maybe in the introduction. Um, but much more discussion of that and the importance of situated knowledge in terms of even conducting interviews. I mean, think about the Rudolphs kept talking about the existence of multiple truths not one truth, and you can get different layers of understanding by going back to that same person. So, as Kamal said, you get the first, they're going to tell you what they want, think you want to hear, and then maybe three, three, you know, three interviews later you find out what they really think. But actually what they think you want to hear is also an important piece mm -hmm. of information. Mm -hmm. about our relations, about expectations, etc. So in order to do this, it's all about background knowledge. You have to have tremendous knowledge of the culture, which is situated knowledge. Right. So you yourself and, and of course that happens as you not only as you've read about the country, but as you go interview and then you learn and then you go back for interviews. I remember going back three times and it was only the third it was only after a second round of interviews I thought, wait a minute, no one's talked about X. And I realized that was key. And it was, and, and but I didn't think of it. No, and since I couldn't, didn't ask it because I didn't know it, it's about, anyway, it's about France, but there's no need to know the details. But it's only the third or fourth time that you actually get a sense of, you know, what isn't said what people are silent about as well as and I think that's all very important and it would be I think useful to make an argument very at the very beginning probably in the introduction about our this whole conversation that we've just had on interviewing and the nature of situated knowledge in that context and deep you know I mean, the big problem today is most of our graduate students know nothing about other countries and then purport to do big comparative analyses, big N, but even small N, where they compare mm -hmm. X country to Y country on political economy or the role of the state, and they don't know anything right. about so, these countries. And that's highly problematic. <coughs> right, so so I think um, uh, I, I want to encourage everybody <coughs> in their chapters to think a little bit about the, and to elaborate a little bit about the methodological implications of what they're doing. Um, I could see, Possibly, Kamal and I have been sort of trying to figure out whether we can do with just a introduction or whether there should be a concluding chapter that pulls things together. And I'm increasingly thinking that there probably would be helpful to have a concluding chapter that might sort of pull mm -hmm. together the observations that people make in their chapters about things like the importance of methodology and, and deal with those issues. What if you had a chapter that was on perestroika, which we don't really have here, right. I haven't seen. And I think, I forgot exactly the phrase that Ron said, but I thought it was really smart about data are being kind of they're socially constructed or something. And I think the whole thing when we're talking about graduate students going, don't want to go out, it's partly because the funding agencies don't want to get it, and the universities want to get them through in five or six years. Yeah. And so you're having very political, I mean, they, they, they're political, basically, screwing up everything in terms of the substance of what we may know about a country. Because you're right. I mean, you can't be a helicopter scholar. You can't just go in and, you know, look around for three weeks and come up with stuff. You can't do just one interview. You've got to do a lot of them. I mean, I spent years with some of the people, and things changed and shifted around a lot. I want to give Frank the last word. Yes. Then then we'll, we'll take our break. Okay? It, 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 again, it's a brief anecdote that... Suzanne and Lloyd were very conscious of their own situation with respect to the people for whom, where they were the interlocutors, uh, and it became a particular problem in the 60s and 70s when there was some hint that some of their funders for their many trips, that the CIA was trying to get in 
get money behind them, and uh, when they discovered that, they immediately took action to get rid of that, but they regularly encountered these issues where defense intelligence agency or even state were trying to funnel money their way, or they would come back and they would want interviews, and they would constantly cut them off, but they had to be so conscious of their own situation as they went and did all this work over all those years. Okay, thank you. Let's, um, let's take a, a 10 minute break